Let's uh, meet two people affected uh, by this, should we? Sir? Peter McLeave, who was diagnosed with a form of blood cancer called myeloma last year, and after three rounds of chemotherapy, he's being told his only chance of a long and healthy life is uh, through stem cell donations. None of his family are a match, so Peter's uh, relying on an unrelated donor being found. Meanwhile, Alex Heaton joined the stem cell donor register in 2016. Just over a year later, he was found to be a potential match for someone and donated stem cells earlier this year. Hello, guys. Hi. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the programme. Um, Alex, let's start with you. Tell me your story. Um, I mean, my, my story is very uh, particular. Kind of early, back in early 2016, uh, me and my mum watching the news and there was a, a report um, uh, for a boy called Tommy. And it was this whole campaign, hashtag match for Tommy. It was basically just um, kind of very specifically a mother just looking for a match for her, her child. He was uh, diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. And, um, and the reason why she was on there was because um, not only was she employing more people to register, but she was saying specifically that there was a huge lack of uh, black and mixed race people uh, on the register. I think at the time it was something crazy like 3%. Right. Um, so finding a match for her, her son was just you know, kind of becoming incredibly, you know, difficult. Um, so me and my mum decided to uh, uh, see if we could uh, apply. We went to DKMS where we um, applied on the uh, registry form. Uh, I was able to uh, be uh, a match. Uh, they had me on the register. About a year and a half later, they called me in and said, hey, we, uh, we think you might be a good match for one person in particular. I want you to tell me about what happened next in just a second, yeah. but I would also want to know what uh, your story is, Peter. Yeah, so back in 2016, I'd just completed Ironman Wales at 39, as fit as I thought I ever was going to be. And then a couple of days after that, I, um, I was taken to hospital with pneumonia, sepsis and legionnaires. So I went from being the highest of the high to almost, you know, I'd never been that ill, didn't really go to the doctor at all. And then subsequent to that, things didn't quite improve the way that we were hoping for. And um, about four months later, I was given the, the rather surprised diagnosis of myeloma, which is a blood cancer. And uh, sadly, it can't be cured. Um, and further conversations have led to a, a diagnosis of what well, prognosis of seven years unless I can find myself a stem cell donor. So um, since then, I've been through uh, multiple rounds of chemotherapy of varying success rates. And in June this year, I had my own an autologous stem cell transplant where they took my stem cells, cleaned them up and then put them back in there. And that, that gives you a period of, of, of remission. Yeah. But, but it, well, we know it's going to come back at some point. So, so I've been... Um, Effective. I haven't, I haven't got a donor myself yet. My, my background is, uh, is a mixed race as well. I've got Macanese heritage, Portuguese, Chinese, as well as Irish and English. Right. So <laughs> I'm a bit of a bit of a mongrel in terms of uh, what we're looking for. And you've but... had four. So you have. Yeah, had, had yeah. So I, so I'm, I'm a child of two mixed race parents. So, tell so us. I am a German and Trinidadian on my mother's side, and Jamaican and Irish on my father's Fabulous. side. So I mean, I always say that I'm 100% mixed. Like, <laughs> like both my parents were able to raise me as a mixed child, having been raised mixed race. So I never, I was never like, oh, this, I'm this culture more than this. I've just always been mixed race. So you were told you were a match, and then what happened? Um, essentially, the process, the, the process itself actually went through pretty quickly. Um, they do, a, they do a, a, a cheek swab test, and they um, have blood tests and everything like that to make sure that. Um, just kind of just confirming what they already assumed, just to make sure that everything will, will work properly. Um, and then I um, go through the process uh, before the donation, where for me, my donation was a peripheral stem cell, um, which is basically just kind of lay layman's terms, just kind of taking blood out, uh, extracting stem cells and, you know, uh, and yeah, healthy stem cells. but normally it's out of one arm and into the other Yeah, arm, it's out of one arm into the other Not for me, no. Um, I had the, uh, um, <laughs> the lucky case, uh, which is very rare, it's very rare, they said, um, that um, because they couldn't get the blood come out from my arms, they had to go in through the neck. Um, and they told me that this was a complication that was like, you know, in a very low percentage. And they also told me that this was most common in petite women, which I am clearly very not. much not. <laughs> 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 um, but I mean, but it, I mean uh, they, they, they told me that this was a possibility, just kind of, I think just kind of for legal reasons, they kind of said, you know, this is something that could happen, but we doubt it will. But on the day, um, of the donation itself, when they weren't getting from my arms, I could see the nurse kind of freaking out about like how to do the hard sell um, for this donation process. And I was like, listen, just do it. Like, I'm here, I'm not going to stop. Mm. And I think as a donor, when you're there on the donation day, no matter how much is going through your head, you know, mild discomfort for you in that one moment is like nothing in comparison to what the kind of person who's going to be getting your donation mm. has been living with almost their entire life and kind of what you're going to stop them uh, from having in terms of kind of pain and discomfort. And what difference will it make to you, Peter, if you 
received a donor? I mean, it's it's life saving. So you I mean, have your donation now, or do you need to wait until the disease progresses again? Or? No, I mean, I'm in a position now where if a donor were to, to come around, that could be taken straight in and have that. So I mean, the stem cells themselves are a vehicle for obviously saving a life. But when you look at what it actually means to people, you know, I've got two boys, day eight and six. You know, and never did I question not being able to see them grow up and leave home, and yet now. You know, if I get to see them into teenage years, then that'll be a, a wonderful thing. So, so for me, you get to look beyond that. And I think um, for this technology in particular, when people understand how simple it actually is to do, but what it can actually offer someone. So for those four or five hours where you're actually donating stem cells, yeah. what you're actually potentially offering someone is the chance to, to see their kids grow up or to meet a partner or to go to university or, or to grow old and get less from the Queen. You know, it, it transcends all racial, sexual orientation, whatever, you know, the, the, the barriers that we tend to break our society down into, this transcends them all. Yeah. And when you think about only 2% of the UK population alone being on the stem cell register at the moment, that is such a small number, but it gives, gives me great hope that with focus and attention and people really understanding what they can offer today, um, they can make a real difference. So we can eat into that 2%. And, and I'm running a campaign called 10,000 Donors at the moment to do just that. So, you know, I've been running that for the last two months and already we've got 3,000 new people signed up Correct. and three confirmed matches mm -hmm. for, some, for people somewhere. So it, it's almost gone beyond me now when you actually see the power of, of this technology and I think where people understand what they can do. You're not giving a kidney, you know, want, want, that's a wonderful technology, but once it's gone, it's gone. Stem cells, once you've donated them, they will grow back, and yet those those little critters will give someone somewhere uh, a real hope of longevity of life. Yeah. So, you know, bringing back to the question, for me, it's all about you know spending time and doing the things that you know really matter, the things you take for granted before you're given this sort of diagnosis, but something which it, it makes you appreciate so much more. But the simplicity of the technology and the and the, and, the, and it's not just for blood cancer. You know, stem cell technology is is, is growing all the time. So, just to have just have that, that bank of people there. Uh, for me, it's, it's making stem cells as available as aspirin as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah. so unlike in my position where my doctor said, we can extend your life if we can find you a donor match, but we don't have one. Yeah. I want people to be in a, in a situation where the doctor can say, yes, you've been given a diagnosis of blood cancer, but we've got you a match yeah. and they're on the list and we've already called them in and you're going into the hospital next week to get it done. Yeah. That's the way it should work. And it can work that way as long as people, you know, engage and sign up and, and it's free. It costs, it costs nothing. Let's talk about that in a second. Alex, um, mm. do you know who you helped? Um, I don't know the name of the gentleman itself, but I know that he uh, was in his 60s and he was in, he, he lived in France, basically. So, I mean, like, you could not get kind of more strange in terms of like like I wouldn't I would have never met this man in my entire life I probably would never have met this man in my entire life you know if I hadn't done, gone, 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 through, gone through this process and it's just one of those crazy things in my mind because I applied um, in the first place because of Tommy in my mind I was just like I'm going to be saving a little boy's life or I could be saving someone's giving someone a second lease on life and it didn't even cross my mind that it would be someone who I think is quite fair. Like a lot of people would say that in later years, people just kind of don't think about a second lease on life. Mm. Once people kind of consider their life to be, you know, to be kind of fulfilled as much mm. as possible. But when I thought that I could have given this man um, just any kind of comfort for, you know, for the remainder of his day, seeing, you know, seeing his grandkids or whatever, seeing the rest of his family, seeing, thinking in my mind of like, in his 60s, let's just assume, you know, he's got kids, he's got grandkids. Seeing that that family is now going to be able to enjoy the rest of their time they have with their grandfather and then not be sad or, or any kind of uh, pain or anything like that, that's an incredible feeling. And I kind of, I like, I wish I could kind of share with you how great that made me feel when I figured so that out. So what do people need to do, Peter, in order to be able to do what Alex did? Um, how, what, what are the first steps? I mean, go to, there are two places to start. DKMS, uh, are one of the charities that will, will organise this for you, so it's DKMS. They're on, tr on Twitter, amongst other things. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you go to their website or the 10,000donors.com website and you click on the geographical link, the country you live in. It will then take you to the registration process. You'll, you'll answer three or four questions to see your suitability. And then they will literally send you the swab kit to the post. And it's a simple cheek swab. It takes two or three minutes, no pain, no needles. It's two, three minutes cheaper, but then you put it back in the prepaid envelope, send it back to DKMS, and you're registered. That's as far as it goes. It's like that ancestor thing, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when you think about how popular that is right now and how many people are trying to find out their roots, 
it's exactly the same process, but you could possibly be saving someone else's life. So it's like a nice little cherry on top. And that Absolutely. then you send that off, and you might never hear, or you might hear the next month, or you yeah. might hear, you might never hear. But you know, you're, what you've done at the very least is increase the chances. You're breaking the odds. So instead of it being two percent of the UK population, it could be five percent or ten percent. So the odds are already are in your favour. Mm -hmm. So you know, at the very least, what you're doing is offering hope to people in my position that uh, you know that you're engaged with the process and and that you're actually doing something to try and help. And how are you feeling? Great at the moment, feeling absolutely fine. So, I mean, I've, as I say, I went through, went through being physically extremely fit to having three broken vertebrae, to having been in and out of hospital for the last year and a half. But, but today, having had that autologous stem cell transplant, I'm actually coping all right with it at the moment. So, for now, everything is, is OK. Well, I really hope that people watching this afternoon will at least apply for the swabs and then yeah, see what happens do. from there. If we just perhaps help one or two people, it'll make all the difference. Absolutely. Great to talk to you guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for joining us. Really appreciate you taking